I'm going to give you sort of the outsider's views on how I see things with the Russian economy, what is the interaction between politics and economics in Russia. And of course, I know that you all have your different views on these topics, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we will have after I've showed you a couple of, of slides up here. Um, so I hope, hope this is going to be an interesting dialogue and not just sort of a lecture by, by someone who understands the Russian economy maybe less well than you actually understand the Russian economy. But anyway, that, that's the short background. I also wanted to share with you that I'm heading the institute called SIT, the Stockholm Institute of Transition Economics at the Stockholm School of Economics. But we have also an, a network in the region that we are very proud to be part of. So we have colleagues that we work with in Riga at BICEPS, uh, Senea in Poland, Berok in Minsk, Kyiv School of Economics in Ukraine, Sefir with the New Economic School in Moscow, and then also ISET in Tbilisi, Georgia. So we really have uh, a very strong connection to this region. We, we think that collaboration and exchanging ideas and, and making it possible for researchers from the different countries go and meet each other and discuss what's going on in their respective countries is, is something very important to us. So I, I also see being here today as an effort in the same direction, really creating these links, having these common discussions, exchange of ideas, and try to understand a little bit better, not just our own country, but the countries that we are surrounded by. So this is also why I myself, I'm working on, on the Russian economy and not the Swedish economy, which, which is kind of perhaps more natural for someone in Sweden. All right, so I wanted to touch upon a few different things here today as, as sort of a starting point for, for your questions and comments later on. Um, I wanted to show you a few pictures about how, how an economist can look at the Russian transition since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, basically. Um, I also wanted to make some comments about how I think economics is actually also extremely important for politics, not only here in Sweden or in, the U in Europe or the US, but also in Russia. Um, then moving on to look at what is it that actually is creating growth in Russia, what has been creating growth in Russia, and, and what is sort of the outlook uh, in this process. So that's the main sort of ideas that you will see being presented here now. All right, phases of Russian transition. Uh, I don't know how many of you have studied economics, but this picture is, is pretty straightforward. It's just a time series starting in 1990, the year before uh, the Soviet Union was dissolved. And on the axis here, we're measuring income levels in comparison to the old countries of, of the EU. So the, the 15 countries that were members of the EU back then. And we can see that with the statistics that we have from what then became the, the Russian Federation, income levels there were about 70% in per capita term compared to, to the average of, of these EU 15 countries. All right, in the picture, so the red line is, is Russia. In the picture, we also have the, the greenish line at the bottom. It's basically the former Soviet countries that did not have oil and gas or minerals uh, to export. The black line are the Soviet countries that actually had oil, gas, and minerals. And you can see that that is a very important factor in determining income levels. Um, but we also have the, the 10 countries that joined the EU, the EU 10 in this picture, and we have the Czech Republic at the top. And it's not the random choice to, to use the Czech Republic, it's the transition country that had the highest income level, basically. So we put that in the chart just as a, a comparison. All right, what, what can we learn from this picture? Well. It's obvious how fast income was declining in the first 10 years of, of Russia's transition experience here. We can see that 
going from about 70% of, of European incomes to around 35%, or so basically cutting income levels per capita in half in that first 10-year period. Um, the good news is that that changed around 2000 and, and income levels started to increase again. And we can see at the end of this figure, uh, income levels are now around 50, 55, 60 percent of, of the income levels uh, among the old EU countries. So this was quite a dramatic uh, uh, part of, of your economic history at least. I know that you have different views on what actually happened with yourself and so on, but as a macroeconomist, this would be quite uh, a dramatic development in any country's economy, anywhere we can think of, basically. So, you know, there's a lot of things going on here, and, uh, and I think it has had a very fundamental impact on how people see their own country, their political leaders, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and just to make that point a little bit clearer, because you have now a president that has been in power uh, basically since uh, 2000. Uh, we, can, we can discuss how the Medvedev uh, intermission uh, should count, but basically this is the same chart, um, but in a different fashion. It's again uh, income per capita, okay? Now I include Russia, again the red line, and then you have the T EU 10 countries and you have the, the other countries coming out of the Soviet Union in the green line. So I split this chart in, in two parts. I just started at 100, just to have a starting point. So it's not dollars, it's not rubles, it's not something like that. It's an index that starts at 100, okay? So you can see, as, as we saw in the other picture, at the end of 1999, Russian income levels have basically been cut in half compared to where it started. Okay, that's a massive drop. If you actually then look at the 10 countries that joined the EU, they were already back at where they started. So they were back at the 100 line here. So their transition phase during this first 10 year was much more quickly bouncing back to where they were before. Whereas Russia and, and the other countries coming out of the Soviet Union had a very, very difficult start during these first 10 years. Okay, in 2000, we are now resetting this same chart to 100, which is when, when your pres current president came into office the first time. And then we can see how this part of history has developed in terms of, of uh, per capita incomes. And this is instead a period when, when Russian GDP per capita has increased by one and a half to two times from where it started when, when Putin became president. And I think this is an extremely important background to a lot of the narratives about your current and, and, and former presidents. It's not hard to understand why the president that was in charge in the second half of the chart is so much more popular than the president that was in charge in that first part of the chart. Okay. And, and our problem, I think, is that sometimes we make these very crude correlations, you know, that because Yeltsin or someone else was in power in that first half, it's all because of him that this happened. We can discuss that. The same thing, it's all because Putin was the president that income has now grown like this. Again, I think there are other things actually explaining this, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. But I think this is a very important thing for anyone looking at Russia and trying to understand what makes a president popular or not. This is a, the key sort of background story that we have to remember, at least if you're an economist. Uh, so. If we then think about popularity ratings with the with the President Putin today, um, it's quite common that we think about in, in other countries about GDP growth and popularity ratings of our politicians. Okay, so in this chart, I've I made little dots for each 
um, Levada rating, approval rating from Levada Center of President Putin or when he was Prime Minister. And I'm, I'm plotting that against GDP growth numbers down there, okay? So in most places, we would expect to see a relatively strong positive line going through this chart. Because usually presidents become more popular when the economy is growing well, and they become less popular when the economy is not doing so well. This we cannot really see in this chart. But to me, that's not the whole message of this chart, though, because it really has three very distinct periods uh, in this time when, when other things were going on that sort of takes away this expected correlation. So I've outlined three different periods here. The global financial crisis, uh, what happened after the invasion of Crimea, uh, in, in Ukraine 2014, and, and the first year in office for Putin. So these were very distinct episodes that had very different factors um, driving uh, popularity ratings. So if we actually exclude them for one second and see what happens, this is what we get. Uh, and this is exactly the type of chart that that made sort of the standard American expression. It's the economy stupid when they talk about how popular is their president when they have elections. This is exactly this chart. It's the economy stupid also for Vladimir Putin in Russia. Okay, so the correlation is 70% saying that when the economy is doing well, popularity ratings are going up. Of course, we, we can add the fact that you know, having approval ratings of, of 60, 75 percent, that's extremely high. So, you know, for, for most countries, the chart would be much further down, but it would be still this slope, that growth is good for popularity ratings. And, and this is something, again, I think, uh, as an economist, we'll, we sort of like to focus on. This is an important issue. Uh, also for Russian politics at a different level and at different times the picture looks like this but in the background we have this very strong correlation between uh, a president's approval rating and, and what's going on in the economy. All right, so what's behind uh, these growth numbers in Russia? Well, you have to have very good eyesight if you're sitting in the back of the room and trying to figure out all the things that I put here, but it's basically, the idea here is not for you to read all of the dots and lines and numbers. I'm, I'm just showing you different pieces of evidence that suggest that there is a very, very strong correlation between what is happening to international oil prices and GDP growth in Russia. Okay, so on the top here, Russian GDP and oil prices, you have exactly that chart. So the black line is what happens to oil prices in dollars, and the red bars is GDP per capita measured in US dollars. We could measure it in ruble, and it, it changes a bit. Um, and, and the important thing for me here to understand is that President Putin managed to become president at sort of the far end of that chart, and oil prices was increasing by a factor of four to five during his first two, two terms in office. Okay, so when, when people then have the narrative that the president made the country grow like this, my comment would be yes, but he was lucky because oil prices were really, really, really increasing fast this time. And, and we can also see that that correlation has, has sort of followed and with the ups and downs in, in the later years. And if you then want to do a little bit of statistics, which I don't suggest anyone to do unless you're an economist to have a very boring life, um, you can actually run the regression with oil prices and, and GDP. And we can see that you, we can explain between 67 and 90 percent of Russia's growth by just one variable, which is international oil prices. Uh, 
The problem with that, though, the second part of this chart is about uncertainty. So international oil prices is not something that is determined by the Russian president or the finance minister or the central bank governor. It's determined on an international market which is very, very hard to predict. Okay, so if we then combine that fact, the difficulty of predicting oil prices with the fact that oil prices are so important for Russian growth, it basically means it becomes very difficult to pre predict Russia's growth numbers. Um, and in the bottom here is just some evidence showing you exactly how important this uncertainty is, which says that when, when people make mistakes when they forecast Russia's growth, about 80% of these mistakes come because they couldn't really predict oil prices correctly. Uh, and then we can say, why can't they predict oil prices correctly? Well, because it's very difficult. And it's very difficult, as we can see in that part of the figure, when the IMF puts out the forecasts of oil prices in the world, we can see that after one or two years, oil prices could be anywhere from 20 to 120. That's enormous variation in oil prices. And these kind of variations in oil prices mean a difference of having a negative growth of 5% in Russia to having a positive growth of 10% instead. So, you know, the, these are extremely, extremely hard circumstances when it comes to predicting uh, growth then in Russia. So, oil prices is creating both growth, but it's also creating a lot of uncertainty. And the reason I'm, I'm discussing uncertainty here is, of course, that if you are very in, uncertain about what's going to happen in the economy in the next couple of years, if you're trying to think about what am I going to do with my money, how much am, am I going to invest, what can I consume, where should I send my kids to school, if you feel that there's a lot of uncertainty where your own income is going, where the exchange rate is going, where the markets are going, you become, of course, hesitant to make some of these investments. So here we see that, that the international oil market creates a lot of uncertainty. But on top of that, uh, I think also that the Russian government has created a lot of uncertainty uh, on its own. Uh, and, and one way of showing this is <clears throat> to look at what happened to, to the Russian stock market uh, the RTS index that you may know. And, and this is just a, a chart where you see how volatility or uncertainty in the stock market has developed uh, since January 2012 until July 2018. And we can see some very prominent spikes in this volatility. Uh, the first spike here coming at, at the sanctions that follow the annexation of Crimea. Uh, the second spike is when the EU and US banned trade with Crimea. And then at the far end here, we have the combination of, of extended sanctions with the Skripal poisoning going on in London. So these, I would say, are sort of homemade Russian uncertainty that shows very, very strongly uh, if you take a measure like the stock market like this. And, and if you see also the, the magnitude of, of this extra uncertainty, this is normalized volatility. So, so in, in regular years, it should be around the zero line. But you can see that at these peaks, it goes up to two, three, or four uh, almost. So this, these are sort of not marginal changes in uncertainties, these are massive changes in uncertainty created by policy actions uh, by the Russian government, I would say. So very different from, from the uncertainty that comes from international oil markets. This is something connected directly to, to policies uh, of the Russian leadership. Uh, okay, so I, I mentioned very briefly what uncertainty does to your thinking about how, how you invest and consume. Um, and I just wanted to show you that if, if we look at uh, a simple growth model of Russia and other countries, uh, 
the most important variables that stand out is secondary schooling and then investment to GDP. I highlighted investment to GDP here uh, with these yellow uh, little marks. Um, and we can see how, how investment to GDP also has been different uh, between Russia and, and the countries that joined the EU, the EU 10 countries. So instead of having 23% of investments to GDP, Russia in this period had 16% of investment to GDP. And of course, that then means that growth that we could predict from some, a simple model like this is almost 1.5% lower than it could have been if Russia had the same kind of investment as the CU10 countries. Uh, and I think we can all agree that fundamentally there are very good reasons to make investments in, in Russia, uh, as good reasons to invest anywhere in Europe, I would say, but for some reason people are not doing this. And I think this uncertainty that we have been looking at is, is one of the key factors for this. But, but that said, you know, when we have a model like this, we can actually see that Russia's growth is quite similar to other countries given the level of investments that we have seen in the country. So it's not like Russia is fundamentally different in the sense that investment wouldn't help. Instead, this is telling you the story that Russia, like most other countries, need education, it needs investment in physical capital. That's what generates growth ultimately. Okay. But what is then happen happening to, to the money that is coming and leaving Russia? Um, again, you have to have very good eyesight if you're going to see what it says down there. But, but the whole, whole uh, point of this chart is that, it, that that bottom purple line shows how much private capital uh, has left Russia. Okay. So you can see in the first phase of transition, a little bit of capital kept leaving Russia, uh, but it never went down more than to 150 billion US dollars, which is the scale here. But we can see that after the global financial crisis in 2007 and 8, which is also when oil prices fell very dramatically, capital flows really started to go out of Russia. So, at the end of this chart, this is second quarter of 2018, 700 billion US dollars had left Russia net. Okay? 700 billion US dollars. Okay, it's very hard to get the sense of what does a number like this mean, but I can tell you it's two times all of the investments that was made in fixed capital in Russia in 2017, okay? So you could basically add two years worth of investments at, at what was going on in 2017 if this money had stayed in Russia and was invested in Russia. And if you back that up to the chart I just showed you about the determinants of growth, that could have given Russia maybe 3% extra growth these years. Okay, so it's, it's kind of important to understand that this is really fundamentally undermining long-term growth in Russia because it really is taking away a lot of investments that should have been done in the country, okay? A lot of discussions in the West is where, where is this money ending up? It's not really that important, I don't think. But, but we all know that a lot of this money is going to tax havens, it's going to Cyprus, it's going to Luxembourg, it's going to Ireland. Lots of places where you can store your money when you're not investing it in Russia. So the, the big deal is not really where it ends up. For me, as a person that cares about Russia, I think the money should have been invested in Russia in the first place. So that's, that's basically it. But if you want, there is a lot of numbers where you can see where the money actually ends up like this. Um, all right. What is the outlook then? What is going to happen in the next couple of years? What is the growth strategy of the current president? Uh, I, I think I have to admire 
his ability to have two very different thoughts and present them in the same speech. So he was actually saying at, at the public uh, speech in, in Istanbul at the World Energy Congress that um, many started saying that the era of hydrocarbons was coming to an end. No reason for such far-reaching re conclusion yet. Okay, so he's basically saying that Russia can keep selling oil and gas to the rest of the world for, for the foreseeable future. That's the first part of the speech. But then later on in the speech, he's also saying mankind is moving towards green energy. Okay, oil and gas is not green energy. We can be sure about that. So, you know, something is not really hanging together here. So I think. Of course, this is a matter of time perspective. So by the time I'm dead, by the time your president is not around any longer, maybe we're still using oil and gas. But I think when you grow up and when you have your grandchildren, we will be in the world of green energy. And that will mean a big, big challenge to, to Russia's economy in the future. Exactly for the reason I just showed you how important oil is for generating growth in Russia. Okay, so this is, this is really the problem, I think. If, if your ultimate policymaker has not made up his mind if, if oil and gas is the future or not, you know, this is something that you should all be worried about. Uh, but then, of course, my solution would be, how do we get investments going like we saw? What is it that, that is missing in Russia today that would make the capital stay in the country and that would make you invest in things that will provide an alternative future to oil and gas? Uh, and I think basically all the economic research that we can think of come to the conclusions that institutions that protect property rights and take care of, of our common goods, uh, these are fundamental to get investments to happen. Okay? So what are the kind of institutions that we can think of? Well, I mean, it's hard to actually put exact labels on these things, but I listed a couple of, of the institutional measures that the World Bank are using when they look at different countries. So I just plotted government efficiency, rule of law, and corruption here, and I put how they rank the Russian institution, institutions in these areas, uh, and compared with how they rank the Swedish institution in the same areas, okay? So we can just see that there is a little bit of work needed to be done in Russia in terms of institutions. There's a lot of catch up in terms of these kind of institutions. And fundamentally, these are the kind of institutions that we think that will bring you investments, growth, a different economic model from, from oil and gas in the future. So this is why when, when you hear economists talking about sort of growth and, and the future, this is what 90% of them would, would sort of go on about. Uh, all right, I want to have a lot of time for you to sort of come with your views and, and discuss this, but if we just try to summarize a little bit what, what I've, I've just showed you here, I think we have to recognize the fact that Russia's economy has come a long way from where it started in 1991, but there were basically two fundamentally different growth periods in your history. The first 10 years was a disaster in terms of economic growth, no doubt about it. The last 15 years have been much more fortunate, but has been so strongly linked to oil prices that you have to think about a different growth model for the future. So that's really the fundamental here. And it's not only that growth is driven by, by international oil prices, also your exchange rate, your financial markets, uh, a lot of other things. And we can, of course, blame a lot of the uncertainty in your growth on these international oil markets that they are so volatile. But unfortunately, I think that your own leadership, political leadership, is adding to that uncertainty 
in very important ways that actually contributes to the outflow of capital. And I cannot see Russia growing by more than one and a half or two percent without fundamentally changing institutions uh, going forward. So, and, and I think getting rid of your extra self-made uncertainty, uh, getting rid of sanctions, these kind of things will be extremely, extremely important to reverse the capital outflows, have money coming back to Russia, being invested in Russia, and, and created a different future for yourselves and, and your kids, basically. Um, I keep writing on, on the Russian economy, so if you like to read about these things in, in very short two, three, four pages notes, you can go and find some of these at uh, freepolicybriefs.org. You can just download them, read them, uh, send them around to your friends if you want. Uh, I was also fortunate to have a, a good international team of researchers uh, and together with Susanne Oxenstierna here in Sweden, we, we were the editors of a book on, on the Russian economy under Putin. You would also recognize a number of, of people from, from Russia contributing to this book. Um, if you're really interested in different aspects of what's going on in the economy, this is a longer read. It, it's uh, also available uh, in different places by now. Um, if you then also have an interest that goes beyond Russia to the region and to broader issues, uh, not all of the policy briefs at, at this site is about Russia. It's about inequality, it's about uh, Belarus, it's about um, all sorts of other issues. So feel free to have a peek at this if, if you're interested in, in what some of our researchers in the network are thinking about. I'll stop there. Thank you.